Hi guys, welcome to the Independent Creatives Podcast. My name is Wes. I'm an illustrator and comic artist, and today I have Jeff Burns with me. Jeff, can you give us a brief introduction? Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Burns. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am um, the CEO uh, and creative director of Infusion Interactive. Uh, we have been in business, I think, actually about 30 years. And uh, starting out in the days of DOS and uh, eventually ending up to now. So, uh, you know, through our course of 30 years, we've shipped probably about 45 products across seven or eight platforms, mm -hmm. constantly having to shift platforms, uh, depending on, you know, whichever platform was meaningful at the time. Uh, so as an example, like, you know, when the Wii came out, I think we had done seven Wii games. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but that's you know, generally the way it works. Um, our team has, when we originally had started, we were a virtual team um, of about seven people, we made our first eight games that way. Um, and, uh, and then we then we went and moved into an office environment. Uh, and Fusion at one time, uh, I think at our highest point was probably about 50 people. And then uh, before we went virtual, we were around 30 people. Uh, we would usually handle probably around four games a year. Okay. So now we were also very much, um, or and are, uh, I would call guns for a higher developer. So while there were several games that we were um, able to put out under our own property, such as Ember and Airmail, several others, um, a lot of times we were called in to help on other projects, co-develop on other projects mm -hmm. uh, for, for whatever reason. You know what I mean? Usually, you know, because there just there simply wasn't enough manpower to get the product out on the date or you wanted to get a fresh set of eyes on the project or, you know, something something like that. So mm -hmm. a lot. And then, you know, also there's when you're talking about work for hire, that's when somebody generally would wants a project of a specific type, specific genre come to you. You know, they'll put out a request for a proposal. And then there's also several times that we will make proposals and put them out. And a lot of games were really um signed off that as well uh it's interesting because you know back in those days it was a little bit easier to uh, get something signed off a piece of paper whereas now you better get you got to get it up and running <laughs> and uh you know which which is totally possible so you know throughout the years you know we've seen a lot of changes um you know over at infusion um we never really had a lot of turnover so it's, it's funny, we all started out very young, and here we all are all these years later. Yeah. Uh, you know, looking at all the different industry trends and things, and, you know, and, and actually as a developer sitting here wondering, like, where, where's it going? Because yeah. when I say, where's it going? It's like, it's almost like, you know, you look at one thing and it's like, wow, this is all very, very promising and, you know, filled with opportunity. And, you're, and then you look at another side and you're like, this doesn't look so promising, but I'm not really quite sure why it's happening. So, you know, mm -hmm. When I say when I'm not really quite sure why something's happening, I really can't define. Oh, things are going downhill. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. Things are not really going downhill. It's just you know. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, um, but you know, being uh, you know, a developer, uh, you know, through I guess the ages that that we were, you know, because I always call ourselves we were really, I would say the second tier of developers. So like the first tier is like was like Micropros and all the guys that did stuff on DOS, Origin before they, you know, were purchased uh, before, you know, and the, all those Sierra, they, they were all like, I idolize those companies, like idolize them. And, um, and you know, I always consider them really, they were the, the first real, you know, game developers, you know what I mean? Not just one person right. doing something, but a team of people coming together. And, um, and then we, I felt like we were the second. And now we're already up to the fifth. Uh, when I say the fifth age of game, game developers, which are almost, I, I see them as like little groups of people now. Yeah. Little groups of people can get things done so much quicker than larger groups of people. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see that now. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's like, um, it's interesting because, at, you know, I'm not sure how many companies are still working in a, a virtual environment right now. But one thing a virtual environment does is it takes away water cooler moments. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no water cooler, so it keeps everything very unified and, and you know 
and clean. You know what I mean? And I'm talking about in terms of like communication and, you know, not wasting time on spending, you know, a wasting time on spending uh, talking about things that are not really relevant to the project or, or, you know, there's just not a lot of, a lot of griping, I think, when it comes on to this. Um, but there was also definitely an advantage to having an office. <laughs> Yeah, you know I mean? mm -hmm. and that and I think that a lot of that was when fra uh, technology was so fragmented that you really needed to have someone in your office show you the work. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't until much later, like when I would say that Unity came along, Unreal progressed a little more, where mm -hmm. I was actually able to know what I was looking at. So a lot of times, you know, a lot of people would leave the office, and I would just stay after and look at the stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think even like in the 2000s, it was really, uh, I always, my lead designer would always joke with me. He's like, you know, um, he's like, you stay after work every night just to fix everyone's work. He's like, why do you pay people to do work just so you can stay after work to fix it? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, because I like to meddle. <laughs> <laughs> Someone will come back tomorrow and be like, what happened? <laughs> Jeff was here last night. <laughs> he was meddling with materials. But, um, yeah, so here we are, and, and as I said, like 30 years later, trying to kind of like figure out, like I said, what direction to go in. And when I say yeah. what direction to go in, is like, there's quite a few. Uh -huh. Not all of them are games, you know what I mean? I think like everyone, like really now, like when it comes to computer technology, artwork, all the things that we do for games, it's everywhere now. It's yeah. being used for everything. So that's kind of like, one thing that I, that actually keeps me enthusiastic is that like you know the stuff that i like to do like technology or music it's all very viable in many different careers now the only difference mm -hmm. is it, it actually no you know what i'll say it's not even all entertainment anymore because we all know how the entertainment industry is right you know it's mm -hmm. rough. but now we're talking about training simulations this every business is rough i'm sure but now I'm seeing people being trained on how to sell insurance, you know, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, real and, you know, these type of programs actually need creative minds to keep people engaged with what they're training with. You mm -hmm. know, because thing you want to do is have someone have to open something up and they're like, oh, my God, like, this looks like the SATs, you know, and uh, yeah. but I think what's going to happen now is we're going to see a lot more smaller companies because yeah. they're what you know what had just recently happened is you know a lot of groups are going to band together now and start slamming together prototypes and on one one end, i think that's really great i don't think it's so good for the publishers mm -hmm. you know uh and you know that really depends on the individuals that are putting together the prototypes some of them uh have only worked in the publishing world so that's really you know like even for myself I've mostly worked in the publishing world and not the independent world, even though we're not owned. So, you know, and that's why I always say it's like, what is considered indie, right? And, you know, it's like indie, a, a, a couple of guys making a game in a garage for no money. Is indie a developer that's just not owned? You know, because in that case, you know, Larian's an indie. Yeah. You know, I mean, even though I think they are owned partially. <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying that, you know, it's I, I really think the term is really more geared towards people that that are shooting to make games that are not, you know, looking to make the highest graphical statements or and they're just thinking about fun and what's fun. Because, you know, I've seen my kids play some of the most ridiculous things, but it's fun to them. You know, and I'll, I'll look at it, you know, I'm talking about just like jumping up on a platform. And they're jumping up on the next platform and then jumping on and like that's yeah. really fun and i'm just like uh, you know like where's the lighting yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. so you know i think that's it and so you know you see a lot of uh development companies really like making very small products not putting huge bets on these products and just putting them out that's yeah. actually very similar to what we used to do when we worked for activision so a lot of times you know it was it was almost i guess it's like guerrilla marketing that's what they used to call it, you know, guerrilla marketing. And, or, you know, or the 10, uh, you know, we call it the 10-foot rule. And it's like, if you stood away from the shop for 10 foot, did your game stick out? Mm -hmm. Now, the irony of this whole thing is, during this whole time that I started this company, I was working at a game store. <laughs> so I was working at Babbage's. It was called Babbage's at the time, before it was called GameStop. And then 
the Babbages, who were the guy who invented the computer, uh, you know, all they sold was video games. So this was during like the Super Nintendo Genesis phase. It was like when Mist came out, and if you remember this. And uh, I remember going in there. So I come home from work and I mm-hmm. rearrange your shelves and put all our games in the front. <laughs> <laughs> I used to go into basketball. I didn't do it too. It was awesome. really My wife used to be like, "What are you doing?" I said, "You know how much this this corner shelf cost? We're getting it for a day, for free." You know, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's also like marketing is not like what it used to be. Uh-huh. So it's like uh, I I don't really even know it works. So you know, marketing. You know, you would go and um, if you were self publishing, uh, you would hire a you know, a marketing firm, uh, you know, to go out and even if you type a game on the internet and you see a thousand returns, it doesn't mean it's going to sell. Yeah. It, like, there's no, like, like, there's just no, nothing I can equate to. The way I used to actually allocate or envision what a game would sell, like if I looked at it on Steam, I just judge by reviews. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you look at those reviews, kind of like, and I could do that because I could look at our games, right? see what the reviews are, know how much it sold, know what a percentage of the people that reviewed it. And if I just apply that to something else, I'm like, oh my God, this game made a lot of money. You know, like if game has like 16,000 reviews, yeah, that's a lot, you know, especially if the game is still in early access, you know, and early access is a whole new concept here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could call it shareware, right? A new word for what shareware was in the nineties. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, except, you know, with the, sh- you know, share where you didn't pay for it. And then if you wanted the rest of your levels of doom, you pay for it. Totally worth it. <laughs> and, uh, but early access is really interesting now. I mean, it still takes a lot of work, I think, to get your game to that point where you should even be putting it up on early access. But it just seems like some, some of these teams now, they're really using it to their advantage to really perfect the game. And they're getting all these. Now, I had always thought to myself, you know, like at first, what was so important or why did people like Kickstarter so much? Like, why were they investing these kind of money in games? And, you know, that they didn't know whether they were going to come out or not. And I really kind of felt it was like all these people that were gamers that just wanted to be involved in the process somehow because they didn't, you know, they weren't, you know, that wasn't their business. But yeah, now they can get on the forums and they can be included in this whole entire process. And, of course, you know, the developers didn't like it because they just wanted the money and they didn't really want to hear about anyone's idea on the process. Mm-hmm. But um, but I think that's what early access is too. It's like, so now a game will come out and now all these people have a voice. You know, what they want, some of them will make, you know, some of their ideas will make it in to, you know, like um, it's a game, uh, I'm trying to, it's called Satisfactory. Uh, uh, yeah, Satisfactory. And, you know, it's one of those kind of like builder uh, games. You just build factories. It's been on, um, it's by the guys that made a uh, Goat Simulator. Okay. You know, Goat Simulator, just so you know, it was just oh, a, Goat Simulator, yeah. it was a game jam. Yeah. You know, a game jam gone crazy. <laughs> you know, that's what I mean. And, uh, but, you know, they've been making this other game, which is so insanely high quality, but it's still in early access, it still makes money, people still buy it. But you don't really have to say, we've released it. See, because it's like once you say we've released it, then every bug in the game is your fault. <laughs> and you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that's, but when it's wallets and early access, it's still okay because things are being addressed. And we can clearly see what happens to these games now that get released that are broken. It's like, wow, it like wrecks everything. And it takes mm-hmm. so much work to fix it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And you're like, what happened with like No Man's Sky? That's a miracle. Yeah, that's pure determination miracle. That's like, oh, this is all we got. We better, you know, and like I admire it, and I admire what they did to Cyberpunk. I don't, yeah. think they, I don't really think they had a choice, but yeah, you know, saying like because the expectation was high, it's a lot of money that game, to me, mm-hmm. but they sure fixed it. Like, but many other companies do not get the opportunity to do that, and yet their game still costs a tremendous amount of money to make. Mm-hmm. You know, back then, you know, in two thousand five, you know, you. You get a budget of $5 million, it was a lot of money. Now that's like pre-production. No, wait, that's the trailer. Like, I'll look at a trailer for a game, I'm like, wow. That's like the budget of one of the whole entire games. You know, wow. even back then, I'm not sure how far you go back in, in games, but just, games used to cost $30,000 to make. Yeah. 
like you know i remember um you remember the game descent yeah yeah, yeah i remember having a conversation with the guys that made descent that's all it cost like, <laughs> but that was a long time ago i mean you yeah. know that was you know that was uh that was in the 90s yeah i mean it's like everything has changed pay grades have changed outsourcing has changed you know like, are you are you are you nostalgic for the old days like looking at very, uh, same... if, yeah, if you saw my game collection you would think i was a lunatic quarter like yeah. i i kept all my old boss games i used to have this huge game room in my office yeah. Of all like air, you know boxes in pristine condition that I, I still have them. I'm like carrying them around with them. I want to throw them out. But yeah, I'm a, a huge I, I mean, believe me, I still I really like the new stuff. So I'm like not anti new yeah. game or mm -hmm. but there was I think there was something about uh the old stuff that was very magical to me until I learned how to do it. Mm. So, okay. like, I would look at these old games, and it's like, wow, you know, like, this is just incredible. But then once I became a developer, it everything kind of switched around. Now I look at it as it's created. The first thing I'm doing is pulling it apart. Yeah. I'm not, like, you know what I mean? I'm not running through it, looking like, wow, beautiful. I'm like, no, what did they put on the ground? You know, how mm -hmm. did they build this? How did they, you know, I, uh, only games that are out of my genre can I really get into because I'm not thinking about mm -hmm. how it was done. Like mm -hmm. a side scroller, for example. You know what I mean? Like I've looked at side scrollers yeah. and it's like I don't really think too much. I just enjoy it for what it is. Anything that I'm competitive with, um, you know, it's you know, it, it does get kind of that way where so the nostalgia I think is really more of the wonder of not knowing how something was made. Okay. You know, you know, rather than just maybe the context of what the games were, even though they were way simpler. I mean, you know, when you think about like an old Sierra, Sierra Adventure game, I definitely got the same amount of satisfaction out of that as I get out of something now. You know, yeah. it was way shorter. It was still the same price. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, Sierra game came out in 1990. It was still 40 bucks, 49 bucks. So, you know, not much has changed. You know, even the games that, you know, that are coming out now, you know, when, when they're $69 and people are getting upset, I'm not surprised. I mean, I don't know, like to make a, a game for this console is hard. I'm not saying it's hard, but there's, you either go one way or the other way. You're mm -hmm. either going to be uh, super massive and get everything perfect, almost perfect, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or your game is not going to look good because of the uncanny palette. Yeah. Like, like we're just getting there. It's like, I almost feel like if you cannot reach this, don't try. Go here. Because, you know, and when I said, mentioned the word that, you know, that I heard the other day, the boomer shooter, I got it. I knew what it was. It was yeah. like, oh. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Because those kind of games still have a lot of fun. And what they're doing is they're just going around all of the money costing process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And just getting right to the level design. What is the level design? What made Quake Quake? What made Doom Doom? It was the level design. It wasn't what we, I mean, it was what it looked like because it was pretty amazing at the time. Mm -hmm. But now when you, you're, you're in a world where everything looks so good. Yeah. It's like, I don't think there's anything, uh, you know, that I've really looked at like where I was like, whoa. Like, I mean, a couple of things, you know, a couple, don't get me wrong. But most yeah. of it was style centric and yeah. not realism. Totally. You know I mean, like just just not realism. And uh, and again, I, I think it's because it's leveled out, you know, and then when we start to see the last generation of games on these current consoles that we have now, that's when you really see the magic. You ever notice yeah. that last? Like what if I think of like the last game on the PS2 <laughs> that I played was the best game. It was called Rogue Galaxy. Right. And it was just like so advanced to any other PS2 game. And then the last game on what the PS3 was The Last of Us which was yeah. a advanced game, you know? So it's just mm -hmm. real, like, it's like that you got to get to the end of the cycle to get to the real, you know, the really good looking games. However, I will say that, you know, with all the features now that are in, in, in Unreal itself specifically, they kind of give you the power to do this already. We used to have to code our own lighting and code our own, you know, and it's like, we don't have to really do that anymore. It's, it's so much more art centric now than it was. Everything mm -hmm. used to be art centric. It was mm -hmm. based around coders. You know, it's, it's I, I hate to admit this, but it's like, you know, back in the early days, it, it was almost like an elitism. 
there's an elitist feeling. And when I started, I, I started with, what was, uh, I started with the programmers that were for, they were called demo groups. And um, these were guys that were just, a lot of them were not from America, but they were um, amazing, amazing programmers that we used to program in assembly language to put 3D graphics up on the screen to try to make it as small as possible and as impressive as possible. They didn't care about money. They didn't care about anything. It was an art. And mm -hmm. I remember when I brought them in and I, I had wanted, uh, like one of my favorite games was Ultima 7. And it's just, I've been striving my whole life to make an Ultima 7, which was Ember actually, when we made Ember. Mm -hmm. And uh, these guys were just like, you're exploiting our craft. And, you know, and then one of them went and found PayPal. And I was really upset. <laughs> I was just like, really? <laughs> you were yelling at me, you know, for, uh, you know, exploiting your craft? And you did that, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, you know, but uh, actually a lot of them ended up, a lot of guys in the younger days that were very elitist about their programming ended up going very commercial oh, wow. know, with their programming. I don't ever feel like art was an elitist thing in video games. You know what I mean? It just didn't, it just didn't have the same mentality because it was a very much more what you see is what you get. Yeah. You know, and um but yeah, I think that elitism is all gone. And now it, it's really back to who has a good idea. Mm -hmm. What's fun? You know what I mean? That's kind of cool when you really think about it, because now the barrier of the skill is no longer there. Yeah, like, so as you're saying, you know, it's like, I've been thinking about, you know, this idea. And, uh, but, you know, I need, in order for me to implement this idea, I need other people to do it. Like, I can't do it myself. Yeah. But actually, you can't. I'm just saying like you can you really like and 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 I'm just saying you know just from and I think that's the huge difference now and again what takes the elitism out of it is just that it's like when you're showing something on screen whether it's to a publisher or whether it's to your team or or whatever all that matters is really what's on the screen not how it was done and you know it just needs to before it goes out to the public we always whenever we finish the game we always use the analogy that we're taking our little wooden ship and pushing it out into the ocean into the waves to see what happens to this thing and <laughs> and it's going to get thrown all over the place and you know we would see like we would see reviews that were like polar opposites of each other and you know yeah. what's really like the reviews never bothered me really no it just didn't there's like it was weird it's like my mom could say something that would bother me for weeks but like someone me call like great game crap doesn't seem to bother me at all you know what I mean? It's just weird. It's like, I don't mean to be, bring my mother into this, but uh, you know, what I'm saying? like it's just it, it. And I always tell everyone in the office, don't read the reviews. Yeah. Don't like don't like don't play into it. I'm like because there's just as many people. You know, like if they're taking the time to review it, that's good enough. I always felt like you know I always felt like if someone gave it attention, that's good enough. You know, yeah. I just don't don't put out anything where you feel like you're stealing from people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, just like that, you know, and, um, but, you know, a lot of it is just, like I said, it is really like expectations of what, like cost to, you know, when I say the cost of games right now, the, the retail value of games is all over the place. So yeah. you really can get almost like a full fledged 40 hour RPG uh, for $19 and you'll still get people that, you know, complain about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, it looks yeah. good. You know what I mean? And it's okay. I mean, if they don't like it, it's fine. But it's like, what? Only 40 hours? And I'm like, God, you ever got <laughs> yeah. How many side quests we had to add in to make that thing 40 hours? You know? And, <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, like I said, you could always tell a really valuable review. Like, mm -hmm. there were times I had read negative reviews. I'm like, this guy's right on. Yeah. Like, I knew this while we were doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry, man. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get a chance to address it, but you know, but you know, when you get a, um, a review, that's just a, a bash interview. It's probably yeah. an old employee. <laughs> <laughs> Not employee. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, so you didn't feel like, uh, so you, you guys did Ember, which was kind of your version of Ultima, mm -hmm. right? It was basically like your love letter to Ultima. Yeah. Your really. version. Did you, you didn't feel any kind of particular attachment more to like, the reception that that game got versus oh uh, yes oh dude. Uh, yeah that was a, 
that was a huge deal for me. But luckily, he got a really good reception in that particular one. But there were other ones that just didn't like. I kind of knew. Mm-hmm. Like Amber was like, I spent so much so much time on it, like for really? years. You know what I mean? Like, so I mean, literally myself. And we wrote the engine for that game. So I think I would have taken that one a little more personally. Um, what, um, I'm looking it up right now. Like I, I've honestly, I've never heard of it. I mean, it it looks problem. really, it looks really cool. Um, so I'm just curious, like, how did this, how did this process of doing your own? I guess I should actually share my screen instead of. So we can see some screenshots here. Mm-hmm. So uh, when was when did you come up with the idea of doing this? Did you always have this in the back of your mind, and you were yeah, just like, yeah? When I first started working? the company, yeah. When I when I first started the company, I was always we were always doing this. We would always yeah. just get distracted with other jobs, so yeah. we'd continuously get apart, get put off. Technology would move behind by the time we got back, and then we had to do it again, and then we had to do it again. So then we finally got it. Um, we made airmail, and I think we might have just started working on Deus Ex, and we had an Ember uh, demo up and running that was that was pretty solid. And this one I decided I took to a publisher. I took it to Five Hundred Five. Okay. And uh, so Five Hundred Five ended up publishing it for it. We, we but we retained the rights. Mm-hmm. So that's how this one kind of came about. Got marketed, put on the screen. Now, when you're saying you never heard of it, that was a lot of what we heard. That I think in terms of like review uh, reviews, that was the one thing that got at me most, which most people had said, I've never heard of this game. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I was like, and, you know, I, I think it's like when a when a company is like out there pushing like nine games at one time, you're going to get lost. Yeah. And and it was also, that game was also on I, iOS as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a risky thing to do now. Sometimes to put the game both on iOS or um, or PC because one is always going to be limited by the other. So like we even just learned that with the Switch. So we've made um, I don't know maybe three three Switch games so far, and mm-hmm. the Switch is the limiting factor. There's no doubt about it. So we should mm-hmm. be when like we're sitting here, we're making a game that's going to be on all the platforms. Switch being one of them. But the switch is the one that the game should be being, being made for, depending on if that's the one that the sales are intended upon. But it's just the problem to make the game for all these other platforms and then to optimize it for the switch. It's really hard. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, it's like it's a very it, it was almost like when I think when we ever develop anything on the Nintendo platform, it's always harder. It's just always harder. I mean, the instructions are harder, uh, you know, um, they're just a really different company, a very guarded company. You know what I mean about you know what they want, and but I also like their monitoring, mm. what they let on their store, what they don't let on their store. It's all you know pretty high quality stuff. Everything, so you know I know it's tough to look at, but everything in this game actually is interactive. You can pick it up, move it around, craft it. You know it was you know really, it was really what we wanted to do. Um, you know if I was to do it again, I'd do it completely different. But you know like I said, I was glad I got to do it. <laughs> you know, and there was a few others. Like I had always wanted to do a JS game, a JSX game. I got lucky. I love that yeah. franchise. I love that yeah. franchise. It's like one of my favorite games ever. And to get that call from them saying, "Are you interested?" I'm like, "Really? Why?" <laughs> They're like, "We like airmail." <laughs> they say it was because airmail. Yeah. They like the quality of airmail. Now, airmail did win a lot of awards. You know, so like we're a company, we win a lot of rewards, but we don't get any trophies and we don't get any money. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> awards don't mm-hmm. matter. You know what I mean? You know, actually, all that matters is a yeah. paycheck. <laughs> you know, that's, to me, that's, right. that's pretty much what I want. But no, there, like like you said before, there is a degree of satisfaction that I, that I do have of being able to make that game ever come about and get released eventually. You know, whatever the result mm-hmm. was, it was what it was, you know. Uh, when I say the result, right. I don't know. It didn't bad. You know, I mean, it wasn't a million million copy seller, but it was close. You know, do but you, then again, it didn't have a high price point. So, do you um, do you see yourself going back to doing Ember or doing like because you're we we're talking about how the scene has changed so much to where you can you can get something small set up pretty quick 
And it sounds like you've always, your company's always had this balance between uh, doing work for hire and then doing your own thing, which, which adds to the brand of your business, right? Which, which opens up more opportunities for work for hire sort of thing, right? Sure, yeah. So I mean, is, is, is that, is that something it is that you're still wanting to do? Or are you wanting to explore? Yeah, I, I work on it every day. In fact, right when we get off the phone today, that's what I'm working on. Okay. Like, you know, yeah, okay. like, like what, what's going on right now is, you know, we sometimes we get jobs that are just really more engineering than art central. Sometimes, you know, okay. and uh, so during those times, you know, you'll whoever would be working on art or, or will train you know, train on whatever the next technology is or, or whatever to put something together. So that's kind of where I am right now. And it's like, yes. So it's it's interesting me being as the owner, owner of a company going back to roots of programming. But I almost feel like it's kind of good in a way because, you know, it's like almost like my answer to burnout. It's yeah. just to go back right back to the beginning. You know what okay. I mean? You know, back to the beginning, it's like you're sitting there before the game industry or, you know, should I say I'm sitting there before the game industry got big thinking I'm going to make a game and it's going to be really big. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, just like a musician, you know, I'm going to make a song. It's, you know, it's going to be, after a while, you kind of stop forgetting, you kind of start, I'm sorry, you start for, to forget about that being the reason why you're making the game. Yeah. Like I never, I don't think anymore so much, or should I say over the last five years when I was working on a game, like oh, this is going to be a big hit. I'm going to be a millionaire. No, I mean, you know, but, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I find that creeping into my head now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm older now. You know what I mean? So there's part of me that feels like it's really interesting that that dream could still exist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And the only reason that that dream still exists is because I'm looking at other people doing it that don't have a company like mine. Yeah. That don't have nearly the experience that I have. They have a fraction, but yet they're still, they still got yeah. the X factor, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. You seen, uh, have you seen Choo Choo Charlie? The, yes. Like, yes. <laughs> it blew up. Like I don't know, man. He sold like a million units or something. I, I, don't, I think he's I just an know. early. Actor. That's what I mean. And it's just like it's almost like you just never know what's going to happen the next day. It's yeah. almost like a surprise. You know, it's like when someone releases a book or something, and it's like the next day they find out it's like a, you know, like a top yeah. seller. Like, seriously, I just you know, and then the, the ones you expect, you can't even find on the list. <laughs> you know. And I feel really bad for that. You know, believe me, like, you know, when Ubisoft is spending a lot of money, they're making sure it's on the Steam list. You know, it's, it's at the top yeah. of the banner that they're paying for it. Yeah. Uh, Apple, I always felt Apple was very kind to us. So um, they always featured us and that helped a lot. So yeah. we always got editor's choice and, you know, and honestly, I was very friendly with them. I don't, I don't think it was only because we were friends with them, but, but because they knew that we were really, we were... Uh, really uh, it was important to us to push the technology of the ipad and that was the ipad one so when we made airmail uh that was on the ipad one so you know apple got really you know interested and they started to actually you know we would um go out and start producing demos that might have potentially been shown on stage that was always like kind of like a survivor case scenario where a bunch of development teams had to do a bunch of stuff and you kept getting voted off the island. <laughs> and, you know, we'd always get voted off the island before. When I say on stage, you know, when Apple's presenting a, a new product, they'll usually show a game or, um, but, uh, you know, I would say, you know, going back now to me, making game is really just as exciting as it was before. I just think like kind of like the executive corporate aspect around this has really soured a lot of people. And, you know, it's like you just take like, you know, when you take artistic people and you mix them with corporate people, unless mm -hmm. you're artistic, uh, you know, there's a problem because, <laughs> you know, and it's like, I see it a lot um, going back and forth that they don't realize like how important these jobs are to the people that are working on the games. Yeah. It's not just a job. And whenever I talk to people, you know, like my mentoring little kids, I'm like, yeah. man, you want to make games for your life uh, for a living? It's a lifestyle. It's not a job. It's a lifestyle. Totally. You're not working nine to five. You want to work nine to five? Go learn to program and go work in a bank. Yeah. You know, you're going to be, I remember we were working on day of sex. I was at the office for 37 hours, like one time straight. Wow. And I didn't even have anything to do. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't have anything to do, but everybody else did. And I was the boss and I couldn't leave. 
You know, like I felt like I can't go home and go to sleep. You yeah. know what I mean? And like this is like probably before the day before the game's supposed to release. We're sitting there trying to test it, pray and pray that it doesn't break. You know, I mean, you get right to the end and it breaks. It's like you got to go through the whole process again. You know, I mean, luckily, you know, when it, when it comes to Apple products, you can update very quick. Like, you know, updates used to be a pretty big deal. Now they're not. Yeah. You know? So you could release a game. You know, look at this wonderful example. And I hate to call it out, but City Skylines, right? It's a great game. Those guys were really good. But, man, releasing that game in that state that it was did damage. They'll fix it, you know. But, you know, they took over this genre that EA used to have of SimCity. And, you know, I'm a really big fan of Builders as well. And, yeah. you know, just like when I played it, you know, and the thing is, I see it. Like, as a developer, I see, like, I can kind of see all the uh, – hardships like i feel bad actually you know what i mean like i don't i'm like how could you do this now i'm like no i understand exactly why this happened this game had to get out someone said you know like we got to get this game out we'll fix it you know we'll get into some people's hands a lot of people aren't going to have a problem with it some people will you know what i mean but we will fix it over time it seems like that that's just really more accepted these days yeah. they even have a category at it on the award show Biggest comeback. They, <laughs> I saw that. I'm like thinking, really? So someone yeah. gets a reward now for releasing a broken game and fixing it? Yeah. <laughs> it's classic. It's, it is kind of funny, but I mean, yeah. I mean, look, I, I really honestly, I don't think there's anything harder than releasing a broken game, getting trashed and, trashed, and then being told you how to fix it and make everyone like it. <laughs> That's a hard, you know what I mean? You got every card stacked against you on that one. You know, but, you know, uh, like I said, they did it. And, you know, even when I first played Cyberpunk, I appreciated it. I can always see what someone's trying to do and they just didn't have the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, uh, I and I know a lot of guys that, you know, that are not in development that buy the games. They just look at it as, you know, perhaps someone trying to get out of something or get something over on them or, you know what I mean? Especially the bigger companies. I notice they're more harsher towards the bigger publishers. And that's just because of the expectations. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, when you really think about it, it's like, I don't know, you complain, you complain a million ways about Call of Duty, mm -hmm. you know, for people that play it. There's something wrong for everyone. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you say there's something in a game for everyone, there's something wrong in a game for everyone. That's not what I would always mm -hmm. think. You know, there's oh. something that someone's always not going to like, you know what I mean? And luckily, if you build your game in a very system-centric way, you can fix it, you know, right. I mean, without, it, you know, without like breaking it all down and like starting the whole entire thing over or just trashing it. So, you know, in just recently when we heard about that game getting canceled um, mm -hmm. uh, from Activision, you know, mm -hmm. and I was I was actually talking to my wife about it. And she's like, well, how, you know, how could someone spend that much money on, on something and all those people for so many years and just do that? And I'm like, well, you got to think they might only be 50 million into it or even 100, but it's going to cost them 300 to get the game done, get it marketing, and hope it sells. Is it worth it to lose two of a hundred? You know what I mean? And just call it a day or take it the whole way and lose it all. I said, that's why this happens. Mm. You know, because a mm. lot of people never understood that. Like when you you would be working on a game and it'd be looking great. And everyone would be really proud. And then you just get this thing where the game was canceled. And no one understood why. And really what it was is because it was harder to get to the end monetarily than it was. It wasn't about what you were doing or the development or getting to the end development wise. It was monetarily. You know, I mean, like if we get to the end of this and we have no money for marketing, we're done. And if we don't have a good community manager, we're done. Yeah. You know, I'm community manager. I used to think a producer was ridiculous back in my early days. Mm -hmm. I never understood it. You know, like because in you know back then there were really never any dedicated producers. I think the whole producer job really came from the music industry. You know what I mean? They took mm -hmm. producers from the music industry, EA actually, and brought them in and put them on games because they understood how to put together these projects with all these moving parts. But back then it was like, what a waste of a job. But then again, we were only seven people. Once we got above 10, I'm like, oh my God, this is a nightmare. I got to get somebody in here to produce, you know? And that's when I realized like all these different layers of management you know what I mean? So when you're starting out like from a, you know, a very small homegrown team, there is no management. You know, we were a very brute force style company. 
you know, everyone, uh, you know, in terms of design methodologies, you know, sprint, agile, scrum, you know, scrum, and everyone say to me, I'm like, I don't know, we're brute force. Do it as fast as you can. You know, <laughs> like that's all it was, because to me, agile was that. Work fast, keep doing things, you know what I mean? That's all we keep doing. And, you know, so it was kind of like to wrap up, you know, certain uh, uh, certain methods of developing. Everything works different for everybody. I mean, I've seen single developers, one guy make an incredible game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Just incredible. It's like, you know, and it's just like, it's just because like, I don't know. Again, it's it's really the design. Mm -hmm. you know, a long time ago, there was this book called Game Feel. Game Feel? Yeah, I think it was written by Richard Rouse, uh, someone okay. I used to work with. And um, uh, Richard worked on like games like The Suffering, and uh, I don't know if you remember them. They were very good games. And, yeah. um, but the book was all about that. It was about just game feel. Like, what is it when you're playing a game and especially like saying it's a third person game, everything's about how that character runs around. That game could be the best looking game in the world, mechanically the best looking game. But if that character does not have the game feel, you're done. You know what I mean? Like you're just done. And even when you play a first person shooter that doesn't have game feel, like the turning is off, which just there's just something... You know, like it was interesting. Um, there's one game I can't recall this. It was called Redfall, which just came out recently. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed and that the first person controller, which is, you know, really controls the gun. It was so odd. It was just like the turning mechanism was off. I felt like I couldn't control it. And I'm like, how did this, you know, like, how did it get by so many people for someone not to like look? Because all we do is we look at the best one. You know what I mean? Like well, if we have to make a game that has a certain aspect or a certain mechanic we just go to look at the game that did it the best you know because in reality when we say these days you know it's like what's original and what's not original i don't know i don't really think anything is original actually your drawings are pretty original <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know i just think that everything is you know kind of like built on great ideas from other great ideas yeah. that were built on you know from and if you get the combo right it's great you know what I mean? There's a couple of games that are definitely like I, I don't think I saw anything like Angry Birds before I saw that. You know, right. so that you know that I would consider original. There's some things that you know, but I'm just saying you know when it comes down to the first person shooter now, I don't mm -hmm. know. It's like really what it is. It's really more thematic now. I feel than it is mechanic. Like if you yeah. look at what people grabbing onto, it's almost like themes of games, like certain stuff, like ghost hunting, ghost hunting games. They, it goes through a, a genre where it's like that becomes like co-op ghost hunting games. They don't look good. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, they're nothing to look at, but it's like, yet yeah, my daughter is into it. I'm like, how does yeah. she know about this? You know, and it's because their friends talk about it. Now, their friends are not talking about Assassin's Creed. Yeah. You know, and I think that's actually one thing that concerns me about myself is I'm a hard, you know, being, I've always been like a real hardcore gamer. Now I kind mm -hmm. of fall asleep while I'm playing games and just end up running into the wall like all night because the controller is pushed up against my face. And the, the thing is, it's like I find myself not interested to play the next Assassin's Creed. Yeah, totally. that's, a, that's a problem. You know what I mean? Because I'm a fan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm the guy that buys you the games and I bought every single one. Mm -hmm. But yet there's something now that's making me feel like I've had enough. You know what yeah. I mean? And and so to me, it's like how many other guys like me are there that are saying yeah. I've had enough of this? Or even when I play a game, I'll put it on easy now. Yeah. Because I've had enough. <laughs> you know, I because I'm really into story. Yeah. Like, everything totally. with me is story and visual. Like I don't like combat. Yeah. Great. <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah. but like I, I want to see the story. I want. You know what I mean? That's all. Like if I can get the game without the combat by putting it on easy and just seeing how someone arc this story i mean because you know like in game narrative how this stuff has to split up and where you end up and you know it's like and i want to find that out without having to know the rules the nuanced rules yeah. of Dungeons and dragons these days or whatever the you know whatever the game is so a lot of games i'll just put right on easy just so i could see because you know really most people don't make it through 50 percent of the games i mean you can even see it on steam like you can see how many people made it yeah, like Starfield, like, oh man, like, <laughs> bad. I don't mean like, like, I appreciate it, but I'm just saying, like, I've never seen numbers like that on a Bethesda game, like mm -hmm. a drop. 
you know, mm -hmm. and, or people reviewing a game by saying exactly what I was thinking. Like, I love every Bethesda game, but this one just is not holding me. You know, when I say holding me, it's like, it's like when you're playing a game and you just can't stop. Yeah. Not, and you know, and not you're playing a game and you're just forcing yourself to play it because you want to like it, you know, or you've been waiting for it or, you know, and it's like, I think it's like, it's been a long time, I think, since I was able to, you know, genuinely pick up a game and say, I don't want to play this, like, until it's over. You know what I mean? And, you know, I, I did that. I did do that with Cyberpunk. It was a long run. I did it with, like, I remember specific games, like Dishonored was like that for me. Like, I was so engaged in, in the game that the, what they did pulled me through this whole entire thing. A lot of it is the story writing. Totally. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's the visuals and it's the story writing and it's the world. And it's how it's conceptualized, you know? I, w I wanted to ask you, you were you were in the business whenever, uh, like, Valve was basically at its peak, right? Like now, I'm. I guess you can have. They're more of like a publisher now. Like I don't know if they even really make games anymore, but um, I guess they did Half Life Alex. But I mean, what was that like being in the business? Whenever before Half Life Two hit, and then after, because I mean that was such a huge arc for like everybody. It seemed like everybody felt like gaming was going in that narrative direction. You know, because after that you had like Bioshock and then around that time you have the Metal Gear games and you have like all these narrative based games. And then somewhere along the line, those just kind of died out because I'm in the same boat as you. Like I love the I love the narrative. I love like the immersion of like Bioshock and going into the world and not knowing what you're going to what you're going to get out of it. And those sort of things. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe publishers don't feel like there's an audience there for them, and so they just kind of focus the money on other things. Or... Well, you know, regarding Val, I mean, gosh, there's certainly an audience for, yeah, uh, you know, for, for Half Life Three. But I mean, I mean, it looks like they they put things out like here and there. But yeah, to me, it seems like there's a publisher. The worst day of that whole entire thing was the first day, the oh, yeah. first day when, when Half Life Two, and we found out what Steam was. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God. Like, <laughs> and then right after that, every time you bought a game, it had a Steam code. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you had to register. I had the disc. So, uh -huh. and, so that's the, the trend that I started to see. Now, it was fine for a while. Mm -hmm. But then once all the visual novels started coming in, mm -hmm. and all, you know what I mean? Then it started to get ridiculous. And I'm starting to feel like this is not good for the industry anymore. Mm. Yeah, you can really take this two ways. It's like, okay, so, you know, there's one side of it that says now anyone can be creative, yeah. you know, or anyone can make a game release and anyone can be creative. But the other side of it is there's a whole bunch of people that make their living off this and have been for many, many years, you know, and, and it's kind of being very diluted right now. Look, it's kind of almost like music. It's really the same thing. I mean, you know, when I was younger, I was like 16. I, I, you know, I was in a band. We were signed to a management contract. Everything was different back then. There were records. There were, you know, it only lasted for about a month because uh, they only wanted one chorus from my song. <laughs> it was pretty bad. But anyway, I mean, you know, back then it was like, yeah, you had to make an album. And that's how you got your music, music listened to. Now, I've already released multiple albums myself. Have I made any money? No, I don't care because that's not why I did it. You know, I didn't do it because, like, you know, it's like I don't want to ruin everything I like. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you know what I mean by ruining everything you like? It's like your love for drawing is, you know, you love it. But then when you make a living for it, you still love it. But there's still something, you know, you know what I mean? That it's like mm -hmm. it's almost become your, your, your ball and chain. Mm -hmm. Like you ever try to work on art, man, when you don't want to. Yeah. I still do it, but yeah. man, it's hard. Like, you know, like I always have this philosophy. I'll still show up to the page, but I don't know what's going to happen by the end of the day and mostly nothing. You know what I mean? And then, you know, like there's some days I'll get four days of work done. It just all depends. Mm -hmm. I think that like with what we do, it's all flow. Yeah. And, you know, totally. it's, a lot of people actually, they, they don't understand, uh, you know, unless they're another artist or a musician. But like when I say like, I'm going out to work and, when I work, I need like five hours straight. 
Yeah. Like, if I'm in a flow, I'm in a flow. And it can't stop. I can't like stop and go pick somebody up and then come back and get back in my flow. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, just gotta be, you know, and that's like a lot of times when, when I worked on into the night, it was just because of that flow. Cause I always yeah. feel like if you got it. You better keep it. Cause totally. it's going to be gone soon <laughs> when you mm -hmm. wake up tomorrow morning, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, but, um, it's I like an, an, what's up? It's like an idea is like that too, because yeah. then there's an idea and it has a timing and like certain. I'm sure you've seen it in your business, certain oh, people, yeah. come together and it's like, oh, we got to hit, we got to hit this while the iron's hot, because this isn't going to come back around again. Yeah, you know, it's like so rough, and then you hit it, and then you find out something else. Someone gets it right, you know what I mean? Like, you ever see that happen? Mm -hmm. Two games, exactly the same. And you're like, how did this happen? You know, yeah. and, and you know, it's just like. Well, it happened. Well, obviously, someone didn't know what else someone else was doing because, you know, it's non-disclosure. I mean, but, yeah, it's almost like when you think of an idea, you better execute fast. You can't sit around and, you know, I just always wonder to myself, like, I see so much planning. Mm -hmm. I see more planning than working. Yeah. And most of the time, the plan is completely organic and falls apart anyway in the middle. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be sounding that. I'm just being real. Yeah. You know, yeah. our plans always change. Like, and most of the time it's actually from an outside force. It's not from an internal decision. You know what I mean? Like, hey, let's change all the characters to green and we'll have another enemy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, no, but I mean, you know, um, it was actually one really good example is, um, was Deus Ex when we made it, it was actually twice as big. Okay. Like twice as big, the whole game was, and we cut it in half. And that was an external thing that came from Square Enix to get the game out. And it, it was wiser to make a really nice half a game than a really broken full game. You know, because you've heard the saying, you know, everyone forgives, you know what I mean? A late game, that's awesome, but no one forgives. Well, at least in most cases these days, no one forgives a broken game. You know, yeah. So not. You know, so when we did that, like that was a really tough decision because a lot of work like was going down the drain. And, yeah. you know, even like when I would go through like interviews, I would always say, you know, during the interview, like, how would you feel if this happened? Like you worked six months on animating something and it just got thrown out. You know, and some people were like, well, I don't know. Well, you know, and some people were like, that'd be horrible. I'll be like, oh, no. Gonna <laughs> 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 happen <laughs> You know, <laughs> I used to say things like, you know, if you can't make these characters in these games, I'm going to be making, you're going to be making crates for two years. All you're doing <laughs> is crates. <laughs> that would be my <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but it, it was, uh, you know, but what, getting back to what I was saying before about the planning is the plans always change. And like, I don't think I've ever started once, except for Amber, probably, with the design doc that stuff the whole way through. You know what I mean? Because like new technologies are constantly coming along and then someone releases something that takes like one of your main features and does it better, you know? And then like, you know, I, you know, so it's interesting because I don't know if that happens so much time in, in games. You know, I, I think in business software, like features being better is worse. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, well, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, because like in games, it's like I forgive bad features if they're good features. Like I can totally ignore certain aspects of games, such as like if the crafting isn't needed, you know, but you know, there's some people that just want to learn every, you know, like I, I can't, when I see people like, and they have like 2000 hours on a game, I'm like, that's amazing that someone got so much time out of that small amount of money that was spent, Yeah. you know, on that game. And it's just like, you know, that's, to, you know, to me, even like the first city skylines with all the modding. And, you know, that game came out like 2015 and it's still as popular now as it ever was, even with the sequel being released. And to me, that's amazing. Someone mm -hmm. was able to foster a community that long. You know, and I know that's becoming, you know, really part of this industry is like, you know, all the, the user created content, yeah. you know, and, but I'm really not sure how viable that really is. You know, I mean, like when you talk about something like Roblox, I don't know how many people are really making money off Roblox. And it's Robux, by the way. That's what you make. And, uh, you know, and I know a lot of people, you know, with Fortnite, I think that's viable. Because yeah. Fortnite is still in play. We, you saw, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you saw the Disney acquisition the other day. 
no. is to purchase five percent of um, Epic. Oh wow! To use all the properties from Disney and Fortnite. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, but yeah. especially after Power World just came out. And Power World doesn't sound like it was done by a design doc. I'm sorry. I've read about it. And it's like listening to what this man said. I'm like, wow. How? Like, if I went to my team and said, let's make Pokemon with guns, they would tell me to take a walk. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, literally, they would. You know, and it's like, like or they, you know, like me, but, you know, it's like when I asked, because I was never into that, and I asked my tech director, I'm like, so, like, what is it? He's like, it's Pokemon with guns. You know, I'm like, really? That's it? And he's like, well, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I'm like, why is it so popular? He's like, people like Pokemon. I'm like, why are we making stuff that looks like Pokemon? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes as a developer, like the answer is like literally right in front of you, but you have your artistic, you know, mm -hmm. endeavors that you really, you know, you just really want to tackle. You know, it's like sometimes you just want to do something to say you did, not to say you made money off. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, there's something more satisfying actually about doing something because the money always goes. <laughs> the money yeah. always disappears anyway. But the product was gone. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to see a lot more licensing moving forward again. You know yeah. what I mean? And just like, it's when I, it's like, I just, you know, and, and you know, like to say, get to get back to your thing about Steam, I, I'm not want to bad mouth Steam, but I just think they opened, they really diluted our industry. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, not only, what's up? It seems like it's, maybe it was inevitable on some, on some level, you know, I mean, I'm sure they didn't expect for it to be as diluted as it is. Cause it is crazy. Like I have a, I have a friend of mine who just finished up her game. She worked on for like three years and she didn't really do any kind of marketing for it. She put it out there. Um, I have an interview with her on my, on this YouTube channel for those that want to check it out. Uh, the game is called Jackie's Wacky Adventure. But anyway, uh, she put a ton of time into this. And, um, you know, she released it. And I think within that month, there was like 2,000 games released or something like that on Steam. But, I mean, I, they definitely diluted it. But at the same time, it kind of goes hand in hand with just the explosion of, like, Twitch and YouTube and people creating, like, these viral moments around games. It seems like something like that is it was kind of inevitable like that's just kind of the way the internet has grown right because well, yeah, i mean like, where else would that where else would that uh where else would that exist if it, if it wasn't for steam you know these these people no, i agree there. it's made it cultural yeah uh, in, in a way and it's like even if you look um you know i could say at the you know the xbox store or the PlayStation Store, you do see there is a little bit going on there too, but not not like this. You know what yeah. I mean? Because the thing is, Steam, you know, used to have some. They used to have the green light process, and the green light process was you had to be voted to be able to get your game up on there. That was about six years ago. Then they dropped the green light price process and just made a hundred dollar fee if you wanted to release your game, and that was it. And that's when everything started, and that's when all the visual novels started showing up. You know, yeah. I mean? and like, you know, I mean, I think, you know, what they are. Yeah. And, and the yeah. sex game started showing up and it's like, I don't know. It's like, not like I have anything against sex or anything, but come on, man. Don't make my yeah. RPG with sex. I mean, like you can, but you know what I mean? Like, not like this, not like where yeah. I see the thing is because you just scroll over the, um, uh, you know, the icons you know, like yeah. and you never know it's going to come up because, you know, some, if it's dirty, they're supposed to mark it that it doesn't yeah. come up with the preview. I'm sitting there yeah. with my kid. I feel like yeah. a dirty old man. It's like crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's the stuff they're showing us. You know, yeah. It's, you know, it's really uncanny valley sex. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I, I just never knew that stuff was on there. Like, I thought it stopped at the visual model. And then, um, you know, but I, I, they're really, they're definitely more of a distribution now. Yeah. Now, you know, like, I mean, you what know, was your as a developer, what was your what was your first opinion when like everybody at the studio played Half Life Two? Was it like? Oh, we were blown away. It was well. Yeah. Was, well, what's interesting actually at that point before Half Life Two was out, we were baking a game with the Source Engine. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so um, 
so we were working with the engine before the game. So, so we kind of knew. But when we were looking at it, it was in really nasty form. You know what I mean? It was nothing like what the game ended up being like. Yeah. And um, when it came out, I was just amazed. Amazed. I mean, just even from the first few seconds. From like, I don't know if you remember how well you remember the game, but like when you walk off the train and, and the guy made you pick up the garbage and put it in the can, I'm like, oh my God, that's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like everything. Like I remember Raven Home, yeah. which was one of the that haunted level. I just like there's so many. And I played the episodes too. I played through yeah. both of those. And yeah. like I was really into it. And you know, like there's one part of me that feels like, was someone over there thinking we can't top this? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, end on a good note. Let's just stay, you know, but it's like, come on, you could top it. Yeah. Or do you have to? Like, I don't know. Like, is it, you know, totally necessary to talk? Like, I had felt between Half Life 1 and 2 totally different visions. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I realized the technology was different, but Half Life 2 was so European. It felt yeah. very European. I mean, like, visually, just, you know what I mean? Like, I couldn't tell where it was, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, yeah, I mean, it, that, yeah, it didn't look here, like in America. But the, it, I think it was the physics. That was the game that really did the physics, like where you were like, wow. You know what I mean? Like I really, like a long time ago, there was a game that tried to do it. It was called Trespasser. And it was by EA. I don't know if you ever heard of it. But it was one of the biggest follies in the industry. And and they tried to do that. Like it just it didn't work out. <laughs> I, I believe I have the box somewhere. I think it's worth like. I don't know, but uh, that was always like a real cult failure, <laughs> you know, the cult failures. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I I don't I don't know if we'll ever see Half Life Three. I think we'll still continue to see like things like Portal, you know. But it's just like those aren't really super, like they're not like huge productions like Half Life was. I mean, Half Life was a really long game, you know, from what I remember. I thought it was like twenty something hours. Something like that, yeah. A shooter like that, that's, you know, compared to like a, a Call of Duty campaign, which is like five hours. You know, making a shooter, it's like, I know it's hard to keep up those hours. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was a, it's interesting because one of the things that we had learned at a, you know, from looking at the books was, it was called the word experiential density. And I was like, how often do you go between an encounter before something else happens so that you don't get bored? And then they started releasing a lot of design documentation from the Call of Duties, and we saw what they were doing. They were doing it on graph charts. So everything on a graph chart, you could almost see the whole entire ups and downs of where the game was going, where the per person had the free point to walk around. Like, that was all totally planned. And that only equaled six hours. <laughs> so how do you make that equal 20 hours? You know what I mean? Because Half-Life 2 was to me seemed very meticulous like in terms of the way it was laid out planned structured worked you know i don't really remember a lot of bugs you know um i i think that game changed a lot like when it when it first came out you know in fact i don't really think any first person shooters came out after that that really changed anything as much as that you know like what i'm trying to think now i mean you know except some, for something that make the mix genres you yeah. know, like, so like when I say when I mentioned Dishonored before, I felt like that was a great genre mix. Yeah. Now, Dishonored was a replacement really for, for this game Thief. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know it's, it's so it's like everything. It's almost like you have a great franchise. Franchise yeah. to kind of get weak over periods of yeah. time, even though I did like the last Thief game. And then someone else picks it up and, and you know, will start to run with that franchise. And it's almost like, you know, Larian just did it. You know, and the thing is, like, Larian has been around for a long time. Like, I played their first game. It was great. They were great before they were great. Like, no one, just no one knew it. So their first game was called Divine Divinity. And it was very Ultima-centric. It was, it was brilliant. You know what I mean? But they've been around long before these Ultimate Sin games. And uh, and they had to work to, you know, really get to where where they are now. You could tell these, these companies that have perfected their, uh, you know, but they they're really very um specialized in what they do yeah so they're not doing multiple different kinds of games where they have to focus on everything is always built off this one role-playing system now when Baldur's gate 3 came out i actually found it too hard to play i was confused i was just mm -hmm. like this is so hard and when i say it's so hard it's like it's it's taking my computing power from my brain to like try to you know what i mean and i'm like you know this is too late at night to be thinking this too much you know what i mean but mm -hmm. it was truly brilliant 
like all the work. Like I know a lot of people worked on it. I mean, you know, and obviously won a ton of awards. It won't, but who would ever think that it would be a Baldur's Gate three? Like I just wouldn't think that. You know what I mean? Like you know, because most people don't even know what Baldur's Gate two is. Like when I talk to like the younger generation, there's a lot of games I mentioned that they don't know. Yeah. And, and I'm just like, you know, I think it's kind of weird, but it makes sense. I'm talking about yeah. a game that's 15 years before you were born. Why <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, it's it's kind of weird. A lot of times even I'll I'll play a game with my daughter. You know, sometimes like, you know what a 15-year-old game still seems new to you. Because <laughs> you yeah. never played it. <laughs> so I'm playing, <laughs> and it's like I'm playing a game with my daughter. And it was and you actually, you know what it was, is uh, the last day of June. I don't know if you remember that game. Mm-hmm. And that was by 5052, about the same time as Ember. And it was like I was playing, and she's like, Yeah, this game was made when I was born. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> like, dude, this time flies, you know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, and, and as time flies, you know, so many games are being, you know, produced, and there's always just so much time now. And I think that's what it is. Every game back in the early days, you know, back in the whatever late 80s, 90s, early, was special. Just because yeah. it was just because it was a game. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like because there just wasn't that many. So you yeah. would go to the game store, software, et cetera, whatever it was. And, you know, you just look at everything was cool, you know. And then, you know, but now, I don't know, there's just so many. We only have so much time. Yeah. And I actually, I don't think I've ever really um, in my past had this thought. But I, I'm thinking now, it's like, you know, I got more games than I got life. Like, I'm never going to finish all these games. And I don't think my kids are going to care about my Steam account. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my, my deathbed. By the way, my password. <laughs> <laughs> and here's my PlayStation password. And here's my game. <laughs> and watch. Then they'll probably go and don't not listen to me and then go pay for Game Pass. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. my point is, is like that dish is too much. Yeah. Like so now it's like, I feel like, what do I want to spend my time on? Yeah, you know, and it's like, do I want to spend my time on another Assassin's Creed, or you know, would rather, you know, put that time into something original that I haven't seen yet? Yeah, you know, what I mean, or you know, something, you know, there's just some games out there that draw me so artistically. It's like I don't even care about the game. It's the art that they put on the screen. A lot of it's 2D also, you know. Yeah. But I'm just looking at a lot of side scrollers now that it's just like they're just so beautiful. Yeah. You know, it was one. Oh man, I forgot what it was called. It was with animals. The side scroll with animals. It looked like a Disney cartoon. It was like unbelievable. I'll, I'll find it. I'll send you a link. Yeah. I can't yeah, there's tons that. of those. There's, yeah, there's, there's I mean, it's like it, it's artistry. It's like, you know, like yeah. Cuphead. Mm-hmm. Like I saw Cuphead, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. and it's like yeah. game wise, I don't know. But art wise, oh my goodness. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like I think of like a lot of times when I'm looking at art, like what did it take to do that? Most cases, I can cover it. I'd be like, I know what that took. Sometimes I can. Or I'll, I'll be like, that must have been a real pain in the ass. I hope it was worth it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But to some people, it is worth it because it's not about, you know, I don't know. I, I do. I know people that it's not really about making the money. It's about making the project. If the project makes money. That's great. Usually those are the people that make money. You ever figure that out? You know, it's like, figure that out. It's like the people that go in that have no expectations and uh you know and then if you go and you have all these expectations and all these plans it's like i don't know if everything doesn't go off without a hitch or if everything goes off without a hitch then you're lucky but that's not going to happen so it's best to do things in this unexpected way <laughs> you know to, that, that's that's what's interesting to me about the the gaming industry and i guess the film industry as well it's like you were talking about earlier that there's this dichotomy in the business between the corporate and the artistic and the artistic is motivated just by, I just want to make this thing, you know, like I have this vision and I want to, I want to put this out there and you're following the muse. Whereas the corporate is, it's more about the, it's more about the bottom line and, and you know, I keep in, keep in like a status quo. Right. Sure. Um, so it's, it's interesting that there's, that there's that balance between the two. And I'm sure you've seen situations where that balance has been, probably more flipped towards the corporate side than the artistic side. That's oh, typically definitely. In the 90s, like I would say, you know, all the way probably up until maybe 2010. I think like, yeah, around that time when we started seeing other games show up on Steam that were high quality, 
coming from non-major publishers. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's when everything changed. And, you know, the thing is, like, these guys, they don't have to worry about, like, they're not on the stock market. They don't have to worry about, like, quarterly reports or, you know, most of the time when a game gets released before it should, it's, it's that, that same reason because they want to report it. And they're willing to take the loss of the bad reviews or say, well, yeah. fix it later, but we just need to do this. You know, now for people that are not involved that well, they don't even deal with that. That it's their own decision when they want, yeah. you know, to to put this game out or how big they want it to be or what its requirements are or what its price point is. You know, mm-hmm. all that stuff is is generally decided by the publisher. And you know, I mean, look, they they brought a lot to the table for me that I couldn't have done myself. I mean, you know, back when, when mm-hmm. we first started. You know, um, and what you know, distribution, marketing, everything, all that stuff worked back then. We had magazines, <laughs> you know, with yeah. ads, and you would open the ad, and it's like now you have nothing. I mean, now I have Yahoo, you know, trying to sell me things. You know, I mean, it's like it's not even targeted anymore. I mean, so all I'm saying is, I would specifically go out and buy a computer gaming world. You know what I mean? And it, it was, you know, it was exciting. It was just like a different thing. Like yeah. it's it kind of like it, it was, I guess. Um, it was a different hobby. That, totally. That's the best way for me to kind of like explain it. Like the definition of a hobby of being a game player on a computer has been changed drastically over the years. And over the years, I kept get, getting more and more grumpier about this antisocial activity that has turned into <laughs> social. And I'm like, no, no, no. You're, you're supposed to be sitting in your room alone at night playing these games, <laughs> like, you know, with a yeah. with soda. You know, or Mountain Dew, not you know, like everyone arguing online. Yeah. Like you know, in ESO, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll just cross online, which is what yeah. I see constantly. You know what I mean? You know, because I tried a few MMOs and I did enjoy some of them, but yeah. you know, there's really no end game, and I got a problem. Yeah. With no end game. If I got an end game, everything else needs to have an end game. <laughs> I yeah. mean, personally, you know, but. Uh, you know, but the, you, you know, the MMO thing, it's like, again, that kind of exploded while we were going through, like, there weren't many of those. Like, Ultima Online was the first one when I was in the industry, when that showed up, you know, and um, I don't know, he was pushing that for years. I mean, he's my idol, by the way, Richard Garriott, you know, and mm-hmm. he was pushing that for years and they wouldn't do it. And then they did it and it just became the biggest thing ever. That's what I mean. It's just like you get corporate and it's just like corporate is not... Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of flaky creative people. They're like, "Hey, let's do this," you know. And it's like, <laughs> but I, I just think there's, you know, like even The Sims, which is like the highest selling franchise in the world, they thought was stupid when Will Wright brought it to them. It was called Little People at that time, yeah. and he, it took him like years, like five, ten years, to get that game made for them to say okay, because he wasn't independent anymore. You know, Maxis, that was right when they were purchased. So. Um, and so, like, how could you be so wrong? Like, I'm just saying from a corporate perspective, you never know what kind of people people are going to like. If I had said, you know, back then, I want to make a game of a bunch, bunch, bunch of people that just walk around and interact with each other. I don't know. As a corporate guy, I might say, that sounds ridiculous. I do that all day. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So I always just say to my kids with The Sims, I'm like, you're playing a game about life. We're living it. She's like, yeah, but I just can't insult everybody that comes up in front of me in real life. <laughs> oh, yeah. I get it. I can't just cheat on everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, I that's what that's what the corporate guy missed. Yeah. Oh, we're letting you live a life you're not allowed to live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, like again, that that I the mindset I think is definitely in panic right now. Yeah. You know, and on both sides. You know, on both yeah. sides of it. You know, and and I don't, you know, when when it comes to like the, the publishing side, I think a lot of them are very safe because, you know, yeah. they have their winners and, you know, the winners are always going to win. And then, you know, but there's now we always considered like there was triple A, there was double A, there was A, there was B, there was C, you know what I mean? And, you know, double A, double A was like, like the folk games by focus, you know what I mean? Like Greed yeah. Hall or uh, like they were good. Like they were really good, but they weren't as polished as the other ones. They didn't get as much love or money, but man, they were good. And they should have been, you know what I mean? And I also felt like splitting games up like this into different categories was kind of weird because isn't it just about what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy? No. You know, really how much money was spent on it, you know, and you know what I mean? And I think saying how much money was spent on it 
is actually, you know, I mean, that's really just a justification for how much it cost. You know, when you really think about it, because it'd be hard for someone to say, make a game in three days and charge $69 for it. I'd be pretty upset, you know, especially yeah. if you looked at the game. And it, I also, you know, when I say justification of cost, it takes so much more to make that stuff now. Like, I don't know. I never imagined a thousand people working on a game. I don't think I've ever seen a thousand people except at a Van Halen concert. In a room. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. A yeah, thousand, that's insane. Yeah. A thousand people. I mean, I don't know. It's like even when like when I look at like a hundred people, I'm like, that's so many people. How many of them are uncooperative? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? You know, and you know, that happens a lot in the studio. You know, like everyone wants to work on different projects, you get what you get, you know. And, you know, I never really looked too deep into what I would say personal choice. A lot of times if it was work for hire, it was more about what the publisher wanted. Yeah. Because they were the ones pushing the features. You yeah. know, if it was about something we were doing ourselves, we usually just did it ourselves and just let, you know, no one really interfered at all. And that generally would be the most successful way. <laughs> you know, and obviously with no interference, but I'm just saying, you know, it's there's just some things that we've done that got done really fast without inter any sort of interference with a very small group of people. And it just made me say, wow, like, you know, there's a different methodology to working here, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's starting to show. And, you know, I think that from the publishers laying off all these people, they've actually created some problems for themselves. Now they've got a bunch more competition. You know, now that's what's happened. If you think, you know, 1,900 people, that's a lot of people. How many game companies can be made out of 1,900 people? Five. Five a company. That's a lot of companies, you know? Yeah. So, you know, yeah, so it's kind of like it, it is really good and bad, you know? But we even yeah. see the biggest, of the biggest companies suffering now, you know? And, you know, it's not like they're, you know, it's like I feel like they lay off people that they know they're going to lay off. Yeah. Like sometimes, you know, like when you hire, I feel like it's just like, you know, it's for the project. Right. You know, and then you have, you know, the people that come onto the team that are, you could tell they're more than just for this project. They're like, you know, they're forever, you know, forever, however long they want to be. But, you know, that that's why it's like the world, like in New York, the animations in New York was was just like that. It's like animators just going from job to job. You know, like they would work on like Dora the Explorer, like the TV show, you know, and then the job was done and the, their job was over. And then they had yeah. to go to another studio and then another. And then maybe, which actually I know a few of them, would end up at Blue Sky or Pixar and then that would be their home. Yeah. You know, because like once you kind of get to Pixar, I don't, you know, I don't really think anyone's going to really ditch you. You know what I mean? They, you know, depending on how deep you get you know, or what your level is, you know, yeah. they might kill a cleanup artist. You know what I mean? But I don't think they're going to kill someone that's like technically like a motion rigger. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that heavy. And to, I'm actually surprised to see some of the layoffs of some such experienced people. You know, I'm talking about like just like senior level designers. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I think that really what it is, is the product's over and they don't know what they want not the senior designer but i mean the company that just said let yeah. them they know what they want to do next and they don't want to pay yeah. you know what i mean so i uh, you know i just hope that you know people don't um you know you always see it that like you know it's like hey don't devalue yourself you know because yeah. like what just happened because once that starts happening then everyone gets devalued you know it's like so you know all of a sudden like a programmer wants a job so he's going to devalue himself to half the amount that he should get then that becomes a norm. It goes the other way too. <laughs> you know what I mean? It goes. It's, I've seen it come the other way also. But you know, yeah. it's like, with me, our it's, our salaries were always increasing. I mean, which as as they should. You know, I mean, but um, you know, but now, yeah, I'm seeing people, you know, willing to take like way less money. You know, and I just I feel like that's not fair, especially for someone that went to school to get a degree to do. Now, just so you know, like I didn't go to college. I learned this on my own. So if you look at my LinkedIn, my school is the school of reverse engineering. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I learned. We used yeah. to buy on reverse engineered games because there was no school. So we just had to learn. So like right out of high school, I went right in. 
and just, you know, kind of learned on my own. Now, I think that if I had some years of school, I probably might have done better, but that almost doesn't apply anymore. Yeah. You know, because like, you know, even um, I was surprised when my technical director, his name is Jason, you know, he's got a computer degree science, an incredible list of games under him. I mean, just everything. And I, I, I was just talking and we were just talking about college, you know, because my daughter goes for computer science also. And he's like, well, my degree means nothing anymore. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, nothing, nothing. He's like, if I went to, he's like, no one cares, you know, about, you know, so, and I'm like, what? And, and, and I, I, I didn't know whether he was right or not because it's still C++. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's still the same language that we're using for games now. I understand if you went to computer science and used an obsolete language that was no longer being used in games, but you know, you're, you're, you know, pretty much right in the forefront. And then, and then, but then he'll just point out like, you know, look at all these, these guys have been programming for 15 years, you know, they'll all get their jobs back. You know, I'm just saying that it's just, they'll get them back from probably newer companies that have a more fresh perspective on how things should be dealt with. I want to say more perspective, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, the industry, it like turns over in age all the time. And I feel bad saying that, that I've been in there, you know, for so long. But a lot of the executives that we have making the decisions are not really, on, don't have their finger on the pulse of what's really going on. You know, I mean, you know, like they could look at books and they could look at, you know, financial statements or, or you know, but they're, you know, they're not, they're not seeing that three guys can outdo them. And that's scary mm -hmm. you know, and you should plan for that so if i was one of these big companies i'd be breaking down all my teams into little teams <laughs> you mm -hmm. know well i mean that's kind of what i would be doing i mean i wouldn't like really just like you know betting the farm on one game just is not you know unless it's a really major franchise and like franchises that used to be major are not so major anymore like yeah. the walking dead has been overused now oh totally There's so many bad walking dead games like three or four, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, you could see kind of like with, with Hasbro, it's like, they're very selective with D and D now, but they didn't used to be. Yeah. So we were diluted with horrible, you know, it's just a lot of, you know, bad D and D games, you know, and it just, it kind of happens now like star Wars games. Like eventually I haven't seen it happen yet. <laughs> I've seen some bad star Wars games. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it's just, you know, I, I wonder whenever, uh, you know, something becomes a little Disneyized. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen to a game? Mm -hmm. because, totally. you know, like when I saw a movie like Solo, I worried a lot. Yeah. Like what's going to happen to Star? It's just that particular movie. I like the other ones. They were good. You know, I mean, to a degree. But I was just, you know, like what, you know, what what strategy here is going to change? When I see a game company that was focused on single player amazing games, and I'm like, this is our new strategy, and I'm like, but everybody likes you because of this. You know what I mean? Someone's in there saying this doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But it does. Otherwise, games like, you know, whatever, play, you know, uh, play, what is it? Uh, uh, is the Play Tale? They made two of them. Uh, yeah. It's a really brilliant adventure game. Um, and they've already made two of them. And again, not, I mean, they look amazing. They're not major publishers and they sold like crazy. So, you know, I'm just saying that it's like the playing field has changed. So this whole Steam thing has affected. I wonder how the publishers feel about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, because it's like this made things very hard for them too. So in a sense of just even, I mean, it's great for distribution, right? They don't have to pay for discs anymore. Like that was always the hitch. That was always what caused our problems. And the day the game had to be burned. Mm -hmm. Okay. We would be up all night making the burn version of the game that had to go on the discs. You don't want to be up all night messing around with something like that the day before it has to go through a run. Now, usually they'll only do a run of like 5,000 first, right? So um, we put out a game and I must have been tired <laughs> and I left all the sound emitters visible on one of the maps. And, you know, those are just you know, where the birds come from. Yeah. And they were just all little speakers that were different colors. They looked like Lucky Charms. And so we deliver the game and the game gets burnt. And then the producer comes back to me and he says, Hey, uh, what are these lucky charms on this Normandy beach? And I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Oh, oh God, I hit the floor. Luckily, we, we fixed it before they did the next 15,000. <laughs> but, I mean, talking about, like, pressure. He's like, yeah. well, we got another run going here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. But that that's not really happening anymore. Like, that pressure is not so much there. Especially, like, especially with iPhone games. You can put them up, take them down, put them up, take them down. You can do it with Steam, too. Yeah. You have so much flexibility in the way that you want to release besides committing yourself to a box and cost of goods, which is actually more than the game. If you, it really was. So they don't they don't have to pay for that anymore. And even if you go to the store now and you pick up a box, there's no disc in it. Yeah. It's, it's, a, code, it's a code. It's like a fortune cookie. It's like you know, it's a fortune cookie. It's a steam code. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I look. I liked boxes. I'd like to have a box of some of these games, but you know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> not, I'm not buying a fortune cookie. Yeah. You know, because the thing was, you remember at first when these systems came out, you got the disc. You still had to install it, but you still had to have the disc in. It. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, that's crazy. Like, why? Why wouldn't I just buy it digitally and not have to have the disc in it? Well, then you right. don't get the box. You know, it's kind of like a trade-off you know what i mean but needless oh, to say i mean how many game boxes do we need to own anyway you know now it's all just on our hard drive one failure wipes out your home game collection <laughs> <laughs> you know so Probably. so yeah. you got any 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 other curiosities of yeah i mean uh, we'll, we'll have to wrap it up here in a minute uh, i don't want to keep you too late but i i do want to get like what was it like working on deus ex and like what is it that you loved about it whenever you played it originally because i know you're big into the narrative games so what um, was that like working on it and like did you did that did you get to scratch that itch of working on a narrative project or did you feel like the project went in a different direction than you would have liked no they they, they let us do do it how we wanted so we really could have done it anyway i mean so we could have done a top-down version but you know i mean i was playing man uh mankind of not mankind divided human revolution at the time yeah look, let's make it look like this so you know they gave us an asset dump you know which was like all the um assets from um from human revolution and but that was made in the tomb raider engine which means that we couldn't use any of it so uh we did use some of it we ended up having to you know rebuild it now it was just really nerve-wracking to me because i was going to be interacting with people that um that i wasn't used to interacting with on a different level you know i'm talking like being in a boardroom and you know, i guess montreal with you know i don't know you got new jersey england and france all at a conference room table <laughs> it was like and uh, and it was like you know um it was just also the kind of thing it was since it was initially coming out on the ipad there were a lot of complaints because there were a lot of people waiting for the next deus ex announcement which was mankind divided but when they announced the fall, everyone was like, that's not what we wanted. Yeah. You know, once it came out, it was fine. You know what I mean? It was all right. And then they announced Mankind Divided and everything was fine because they knew they were going to get a real game or a real console game, you know, with the, which is what they wanted. Uh, but um, it was, it, you know, I felt really privileged, mm -hmm. you know, because it was like, even when we went to uh, Montreal to work with them on the story, um these were people i knew like i mean in the game industry that i admired so like um uh the lead writer i believe uh, Mary, i forgot what mary's last name was but she was the lead writer on day sex but she also wrote on mist and i was like oh you know like i never worked <laughs> with people before so i was getting to work with a lot of people that you know i guess i would almost say that i kind of isolated myself from by having my own company you know yeah. because like that's really what it was because otherwise you know, in the industry, in terms of like a network, so many people go through so many jobs. Like, you know, you see it, you're like on their list. It's like, wow, you know, it's like, it's so, you know, so they integrate and they, they know so many more people. Whereas with me, it's like my whole job has been this one in Fusion. So my network is only, it's really more developer publisher, you know what I mean? More mm -hmm. than, so when I get to work with another developer, that's like, a rock star you know it you know, I, I really get excited by that i'm like what can we learn from them you know and uh you know it's interesting most of the time uh when i say what can we learn from them most of the time they just say you guys need to calm down 
<laughs> literally like that like you know like don't work so hard <laughs> don't, it's like that that thing uh, you know like you remember the movie big you ever see that one oh yeah well i think that's what happens in, in game development especially when you work for hire is that you come out of the gate really strong because you really want to shine and you set an expectation and that's it you're done because you ever fall below that expectation it's you know what i mean you're failing <laughs> you know what i mean but yet the first one that you set was you really trying and putting in way more hours you know and mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's something i've also learned it's about pacing and that you know that was one thing that was taught to me about some of the other developers you know it's like pace yourself you know because if you really like you know throw it all in the beginning by the time you get to the middle of the game you're gonna be burnt out you know, and everyone's already saw everything that was good. So I also, you know, learned certain things. Is like the first levels you build for your game, put in the middle. Mm. <laughs> the last levels go at the beginning. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, what are you talking about? How am I supposed to write a story like that? And, you know, but it didn't matter because the story was done beforehand. But I got it because it meant the first levels were the weakest. Do you know what I mean? So you don't want to show your weakest at the bet. You want to show the best. So you show the last levels when you're really doing the game great, you know, and, you know, and it balances out because in the first, you know, I would say the weakest levels, which are the first ones that you worked on, are sitting in the middle. And it doesn't take that hard to get over the hurdle to get to the next roller coaster ride because that's really all those style of games are. You don't really consider RPGs like roller coaster rides or not. They're, mm. they're books. I look at them as books to be read. <laughs> But yeah. any campaign like in a Call of Duty is to me it's a it's a light show. You know, it's a very beautifully coordinated light show. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh but you know, the best moments you usually see are the first ones. And the last one. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But yeah, that that was the whole idea of pacing. Because usually you have different people building levels and some people are better. You know? Because like a lot of the levels are just they're not designed on paper first. Like you could try, <laughs> I mean, but once you get in there and you start running around, and you look, you know, and you, you, you're like, this doesn't work. It doesn't translate to the way on paper that it's translating to me on the screen right now. You know, I mean, especially in terms of like metrics, you know, and, you know, we used to use graph paper and line it up with meters and everything. Then we realized it was actually way easier to just build a prototype level and run through it and just throw some enemies in there and say, was that fun? Do I want to do it again? We always knew that if we were testing one of our games and we just kept testing it and didn't want to stop, we had something good because we didn't want to stop playing it. But when we were testing something, it's like, no, no more. Like, you know, it's just that, you know, those were the kind of like the, the, the one-off games that, you know, just weren't so much fun. And, you know, most of the games that I would say weren't so much fun were the more novelty style games, like the Wii Balance board games. You know, like I consider those kind of like, you know, you have to have this device to play this game. Otherwise, you just mm -hmm. can't play. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So to me, that's, you, you know, you're going to lose a lot of sales. I did think a lot of people bought the rebalance board, but, you know, but that, you know, th those to me were like the kind of games like we're making a game for a device. And, you know, and we, we also made one meditation game that used to connect. Yes, you can make a game on meditation. <laughs> it's called Deepop Shorty Deepop 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 Okay. You can look it up. Familiar. Yeah. That's so cool. uh, that was, an, I mean, it was interesting. And so we were using the connect to like track breathing movements, but you, oh, know, right. and, you know, but it was using the connect and it was like really written very specifically for that. You know, huh. so I kind of felt mm -hmm. like it was limited, you know, because the connect wasn't sold with the device back then. Yeah. You could see, as you could see from looking at our, we've been everywhere. Like, I don't think there's any genre we have, like, and I feel like I always say that to all the publishers. I talk, I'm like, what kind of game do you want? What do you want? Just look on my website. We got everything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's usually like someone would always say, well, have you made a military game before? Have you made a shooter before? Or have you made a hunting game before? You haven't made an RPG. Have you made, and it's like, well, yes, yes, we have, we have, we have, we have, you know what I mean? <laughs> usually it's not good enough, <laughs> you know what I mean? What well, was it good? <laughs> well, yeah. that's all opinion, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what it's me. <laughs> it's like how many months do i have to make it you know the funny thing is it's like you always get to these very beginning questions like the two main questions how long do i have to make it and the other one is like how much it's going to cost 
you know, like what's the budget and how, well, those two things are very directly correlated to each other, aren't they? So like, mm -hmm. you can't say how long is it going to take to make it? You know what I mean? And then this is the budget. Cause I can say, well, that's not enough time to cover the amount of time that I need to make it. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and then that's obviously when you start cutting features, you know, if that's the way it's going to go down, you know, but the worst case is really when you're most, you're really close to the end, the, the development of a game and you have to start doing that. And systems in the game are hooked to that and people still find remnants of it in the game when they're playing it. So they can tell something was removed. Yeah. You ever see those games like they're where they restore content? Yeah. Again, you know, like Dark, uh, not Dark Forces, but like the Knights of the Republic, the second one, there was all this content that Obsidian yeah. put in that I don't think got used, you know, probably like Deus Ex. Like even when we put out Deus Ex, someone decompiled it and found all the levels. Yeah. That mm -hmm. we didn't use. We never took them out. Because if we took them out, it probably would have broke the game. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's like, you know, every game is kind of like a house of cards. Yeah. That's how we always feel. It's like it's it's like literally this house of cards. You pull a system out from the bottom, you know, at the end, you know, you better have someone smart to fix that. <laughs> so, you know, but yes, as you know, really a labor of love oh. and patience. <laughs> you know. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Uh Jeff, all I your I think you do several. I think you just have a LinkedIn, and then we have your your main site for uh, for your company. I'll put those in the description box below. Excellent. And uh, yeah, if hopefully if you like I, this, what's up? I, hopefully, I didn't insult anybody. <laughs> no, I don't, I I don't insult anyone through this whole thing. Good. <laughs> you never know. Look, honestly, I never did. I, this is the first time I did this. Like okay. I've done a lot of interviews. I have a lot of interviews on camera, but I never like, you know what I mean? And it was always kind of the same feeling. And it would be at a conference, usually after I had a few drinks. <laughs> you know I mean? So you know what's really interesting? On my website, if you want to learn about Deus Ex, there's a whole movie about it. Okay. Yeah, just click on the it's the first link under my um uh was it like publications? Unity okay. came into our office and did a whole movie on it. So they walk around our office. You can see us making it and talking about it and the fears about it. And so if you're interested, it, it's kind of there. It also shows us making Larry and Space Noir. Okay. And it, like it was really professionally done. Like they brought a whole camera crew in with lights and <laughs> uh, like, no, just keep talking. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, did I say that right? And they're like, just keep talking. And then by the time they were done, it was all edited together to like look really good. And I'm like, man, that looks really young. And I'm like, no, it's just my beard wasn't gray. I'm going to go get some water right now. <laughs> As I'm talking to you, you look like a youngster. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, man. Uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, you ever want to talk again, or, you know, like I'm, I'm here, you know, so. Cool, man. Yeah. Right, man. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for checking out this podcast, guys, and make sure to like and subscribe. Take care. Exactly.